What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoyed this video and like what you're seeing, make sure you hit the like button. and Let me know what you think of the upcoming interview in the comment section below. As always, if you're new around here, you haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another mafia topic. We have a great guest today. I don't do a ton of interviews, but when I do an interview, I always try to hit it out of the park. Today, we are going to speak to a legend in my eyes, undercover FBI agent Joaquin Jack Garcia. Jack uh, infiltrated many different organized crime groups, but most notably was able in the early 2000s to infiltrate the Gambino crime family. We're going to talk about him and all his exploits today. Let's welcome in who I guess I could call a new friend, Jack yes. Garcia. Jack, how are you? Hey, Jeff. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, and listen, before we get started, if you don't mind, just want to say uh, from all of us, we like to uh, say that America's hearts and prayers are with the people of Ukraine. And I I just, more. yeah, so I just wanted to, to kind of say that. But hey, thank you for the invite. I'm honored to be here. I mean, you are known as a, a mafia expert and obviously not many phone calls. Uh, you've proven that to me. Well, you know, Jack, it's funny you say that because there are certain people that would say, <laughs> Mafia expert. He doesn't know anything about the streets. But you know what? Um, I don't. I don't need to say who I am. I just allow my reputation to perceive me to the people that matter, like you. And uh, I'm glad we were able to talk. I've been enjoying conversating with you. And I do want to just say one thing about your statement about Ukraine. I'm. I'm fascinated by the determination and awe of the Ukrainian people to basically say to themselves, "We are going to devote our lives." and laying down for our country. That's something that I think we in this country need to really take a vivid look at and say, wow. Um, that president says, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. I will die with my people. That's something you don't see much anymore. And I, th I think their tenacity has continued to surprise everybody. So our, our thoughts are with those people. Um, Jack, I've um, always been fascinated by your story. Obviously, many know you for your infiltration of the you know, Arnold Squitieri led Gambino crime fan. We'll get into that in depth here in just a little bit, but I'm always fascinated by your background as well. Um, you fled Cuba, is that correct? That's you... correct. I'm a political refugee. We left Cuba in 1961. So I lived under communism for about three years. Um, and we came to America and lived uh, in Washington Heights in uh, Upper Manhattan. Then we we thought we hit the lottery, we moved to the Bronx. I mean, think about that logic. And there I went to school and uh, yeah, but we left Cuba, I was there during the uh, uh, the Bay of Pigs. You know, I remember hovering underneath the table, hearing bombs and explosives going off. And um, it was quite frightening. I also remember the way, you know, the school system was trying to indoctrinate me as well as the other students to follow and believe in Fidel. Uh, it was, uh, I and mean, look what it done to the country. It's a, it's a mess now, you know? The infrastructure is, is destroyed. People are just totally indoctrinated. And I thought briefly last year, we were gonna be liberated finally, but where has that move been gone? You Breaks know, my heart. It's interesting that you bring this up because we did an episode on our podcast recently on a guy called Russell Buffalino, and he had some exploits in Cuba before Castro, right? Uh, and we, as we know, the mob was you know down in Cuba. They were looking to kind of create that, you know, casino kind of Havana feel. Yes. And Jack, I'll ask you, we look back and say to ourselves, could the one thing the mob have maybe done well and good was possibly to evade, if, if Fidel never gets involved, I mean, today, Las Vegas would be Cuba, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, listen, they, uh, the mob was very strong in Havana. And one of the things that Castro ran in, and he became like a popular, at first he was well-liked. He wanted to get the mob out of there, get the corruption of Batista out of there. And then, of course, when we all saw his true colors, and when then he started being palsy walsy with Khrushchev in Russia, Everybody realized that this guy had different agenda going. So that's when the we left. But yes, the mob operated very safely in Cuba. They controlled it. Uh, and uh, 
they really, uh, you know, had it not been for Fidel, who knows? Maybe they would be totally own even Las Vegas because they would have had the money and the power to just transition those uh, casinos they had in Havana over to Las Vegas or any other place they wanted. It's pretty rare when you have two individuals, the mob and a dictator. The mob is the better option. Uh, let's just be honest. Uh, all that oh. <laughs> terrible stuff that went down in Cuba never would have happened. But um, so you come to America, you, you, your family gives you a life, you go to the Bronx, you ultimately go to school and you actually played football, right? You, you yeah. went to Richmond, you were a spider. What kind of That's football right. player were you? I'd imagine you were quite good. I well, I was pretty decent, you know, uh, got the full scholarship. I actually was at school at West, uh, at uh, Mount St. Michael Academy, which is a very good uh, school. Uh, and it's funny because my parents both worked in order to provide an education, a private education for myself, my brother and sister. That's all they did. I mean, we didn't have all the beautiful things in the home. We went without solely just so we can go to school. And I'll forever be grateful for that. But my grades weren't as good, even though my parents stressed education. That we, I wound up going first to a school in Texas called West Texas State University. Mercury Morris was one of the guys who recruited me. Went out to West Texas, and that was an eye-opening experience altogether. And then they wound up changing the coach which no one liked. A lot of the players left. I went to a junior college in New York, uh, wound up winning the national championship there. And then I went to the University of Richmond. I was red shirted my next year. I played for two years after that. It was a great experience for me. I love Richmond. I'm very close with all my teammates, not only at Westchester community, but also at uh, University of Richmond. And I attend all their barbecues and receive a lot of support, but football was the way I was able to afford college. I mean, nowadays, um, I, I don't think my parents would have been able to afford uh, an education for us. I know my brother wound up going to CCNY, which is uh, in New York City, uh, the city university, and my sister went to some local college uh, in, in New Jersey. So. You know, uh, it was. I think football was what I used to get my degree. I'm not saying that I was one of those students. I mean, it took. I was in college for five years, and I got a four-year degree. So that told you what kind of partying I was doing, and life how it was for me when I was at the University of Richmond. So growing up, I have to ask. Obviously, your parents wanted a better life for you, and you actually have a very similar background too. Most. You know, people, let's just say in that time in New York, you know, a lot of people, were, whether it was immigrants or wherever, they're trying to give their kids a better life. But I'll ask, obviously, you're Cuban, right? You grew up in a, in a Latin neighborhood, Washington Heights. We all know that. Um, did you ever, obviously, you're a kid, but did you ever see any like Jose Battle, Raymond Marquez, those types of guys? They were in that Latin crime community. Was that pervasive in that neighborhood like it is in some of these Italian neighborhoods or Russian neighborhoods? Was that something you saw? No, I, you didn't see them personally, but you did see the bolita, which was sure. a very big thing in the Hispanic community and also the Spanish lottery. So that that was pretty prevalent. And also that was kind of mainstream within the Hispanic community. I remember my mother just getting these little cards and then they would have a book that if you dreamt about, let's say, spiders, then you would be number 741. And they all bet 25 cents a dime on these things. And it was all about this numerology that existed with them. But I saw it pretty prevalent. It was something in the Hispanic community that people didn't really look at it as, I hate to say it, even a crime. It was more, hey, you're gambling on your dreams. You're trying to make money. And I don't think they dissected it and said, well, you're not paying taxes as an illegal thing. It was just something everyone did and I know uh, I personally did because I was a kid at the time but my parents did for sure did you um did you always want to be a cop is that is that always your dream I mean obviously your size and you you, you, you know you had the build of that is that always what you wanted to do well no when I was in college you know I I kind of wanted to I guess like all kids who play football be a pro football player and that didn't happen so I you then ever, was uh, yeah, well, I played semi-pro, so whatever that was, which pretty much you got nickels and dimes for. 
but I never made the big league and uh, you know it's I guess a regret uh, like all football players are but what happened with me was during our senior year we all before a game would go see the coach would keep us all together and we would go to a movie in order to make sure guys weren't there partying because the next day we had a game so I went to see Serpico and I was hooked I mean not only with Al Pacino being this cool guy living in the village with the hot chick and the long hair, but that whole idea of NYPD and this is uh, working undercover and doing all the things that he did, that kind of said, you know what, this is what I want to do. And I remember myself and the captain of the team, who was another Cuban, actually we went and we decided to apply and become uh, FBI. But we didn't hear from the FBI. So then we went to New York City. We went back home. I applied for the NYPD. I applied for the whole alphabet agencies, ATF, Secret Service, Customs, ICE, blah, 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 you name it. Didn't hear because at that time they weren't hiring. There was a hiring freeze. So what happened then in, in my particular case was that I'm watching uh, Univision, which is a Spanish network, and I'm watching this English speaking, this non-native Spanish speaker butchering the Spanish language, recruiting Hispanics for the FBI. And he was going like, yo, quiero, que yo ustedes. You know, and I'm going, what? And he goes, we're looking for Spanish speaking agents in the bureau. So next day I get up and said, hey, you know, I got an application in. Father, a few years ago, I haven't heard from you guys. So they said to me, well, let me look into your records. And they saw that I was not an American citizen. So I immediately went and did the paperwork. Back then it wasn't as tough as it is now. And actually the test was very tough. And I'm convinced the guy giving me the test gave me a wink and a nod. You know, like, yeah, okay, you speak good English, yeah, okay. Uh, and I became an American citizen. And then soon after that, I, I was 1976. Soon after that, I got in the bureau four years later. But the problem that I had, Jeff, because I was Cuban, you know, back then, remember, Hoover died in 72, so the, um, uh, the bureau did not really mirror the demographic in our society back then. Everybody looked like an agent. So I applied, and I couldn't get in. I was doing polygraphs, do this, do that. And then much later on, when I finally got in the bureau, I did a Freedom of Information Act, and saw there was a lot of paperwork from the CIA. And part of my background investigation was that, hey, in as much as this guy is Cuban, the possibility that he may be an infiltrator or a mole should be considered. And I really, you know, think about it, That's, that could be true, but hey, I'm from the Cubans who hated Castro, you know, along with the many other Cubans that are here in America. So I finally got in. I believe I was the second Cuban-born FBI agent in the Bureau. And that was, I got in in 1980 and, uh, you know, uh, being able to speak Spanish fluently, which I could. And it wasn't until 1984 that I, when the Bureau started working narcotics, where I, I guess I blossomed as an undercover. Because who else was going to buy dope? You know, a, a guy from Utah who doesn't know how to speak Spanish. So I was fortunate uh, to have been at the, at the ground when the Bureau started to work narcotics. Now you would ultimately become an FBI agent, you'd be there for 26 years, and most of that was undercover. But I want to okay. ask you, when you became a U.S. citizen, that was probably the most proud day you've had, right? That was in 1976. I'm sorry, what did you ask me? That was a proud day for you? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean. It was kind of like something you waited for, and it wasn't just so I could check the list to become an agent. It was something that I realized, and I said, you know, I've always viewed myself as an American. I didn't know that I had to go and have the paperwork to, you know, to feel more like an American, like being legit. And I can never forget, we went to this, this place in Newark. There was this huge courthouse, and there were people from all different races, all different countries. Some of them were wearing their particular dress codes that they wear. And I remember this bailiff walks in and police rise, everybody rose and he says, you're going to be sworn in. 
He says, raise your right hand. And then everybody raised their right hand and said, repeat after me, said the judge. So he goes, I, and everybody yells, I, state your name. You hear, state your name. And it was like, what? And I looked around, I go, I, I know, how the heck did I pass? But these people had no idea that state your name means you got to actually state your name. <laughs> so I shook my head, but you know what? I had the paper. I still have it. It's fantastic. It was the Bicentennial of America, 1976. So it, it made it that much more, you know, uh, important to me. So you're, you're living the American dream. You're an American Absolutely. citizen. You become a, an agent for the FBI, which is, you know, an esteemed group of people, right, if you're an American. Let me ask you, so I don't want to relate you being an FBI agent to what I do, but I think there's a special type of person that can do some of the things that we do on YouTube. Some of the people have a great grasp of being able to do it. Being undercover is just a higher level vision of that, right? You have to have certain things. You can't teach some of this stuff, right? No, and that's one of the things that I did. I used to teach in the undercover program, and I used to battle with them and say, look, you can't make an undercover. An undercover is somebody who has all those components in their DNA. Uh, like, for instance, you, ha you have to be a person who is outgoing. You have to be a person who is comfortable around all types of people, even those that you may not even like. You have to be a quick thinker. You have to be like a chameleon. You have to be able to, to, to exude confidence to a certain level, not exceed that level of confidence, because then it becomes problematic. But these are traits that you have in your personality. And something that you grew up in, and my particular thing was, hey, I grew up in the Bronx and Washington Heights and my neighborhood, you either became a cop or you were chased by one, you know. So, you know, you knew somewhat the streets and this is stuff that you can't teach anyone. And one of the things I found in the bureaus on the couple program is that it is such an excellent program where we weed out those people who think they can go in and do these certain things that they could wind up possibly getting hurt or hurting others. So being an undercover is not for everybody. And like I tell the students, so what? So if it isn't for you, but there's other packs in, in becoming in the FBI. You could be a great surveillance agent. You could be a bomb tech. You, you can become an affiant on wiretaps. You can just be an investigator. Not everybody is made up for this. And to be honest with you, it's not really a glamorous field yeah, people look at it so, but within the FBI, if you're an undercover, you kind of get stigmatized and you're labeled as somebody, oh, look at this guy, he's been out in the streets driving fancy cars, wearing Rolex, enjoying the good life, and here I am working like a schlep for the last uh, 24 hours watching him go into a restaurant and eat like he's going to the chair, you know? But hey, that's our job. This is your job. Right, it's a role. So it's something that I found that little niche and I was blessed to have done it. And, and how I learned to be a better undercover was I would talk to the informants that I had. I would talk to the informants other agents had and their stories became my stories. So I knew how to talk and be comfortable. And even though I'm 6'4", four, almost 400 pounds, I didn't stand out. You, you know what I mean? It was more like, hey, you know, you don't go around banging your chest and I'm the toughest guy. You don't go in there with an attitude because you know what? You Once you start up here, you can't go here. Right. So only always started here. But if you want me to mix it up, I'll mix it up with you. I'll rise it up with you. But I'm certainly not going to assume personality that I am not comfortable with or that I may slip and mess up. Well, that's one thing that I wanted to ask you about, because one of the one of the podcasts I love and I want to give her a shout out. One of the few interviews you've done was with the great Jerry Williams. She does the FBI Retired yes. Case Files podcast. And I heard you talk about that, where it's important that when you become undercover, you all also don't go into things that you're just not comfortable with, where you could stick out. And I heard you mention with certain, you know, uh, graphic images so with. Uh, you know, basically uh, child pornographers or, or, or adults that, that are doing trafficking, things like that. Certain things, you mentioned bikers. It just wasn't something you fit in with. And you have to ultimately go with what works with you. And that just didn't fit. 
Well, you know what? And that's a good point because a lot of people, even the undercover program when I was going through, I would get into sometimes uh, loggerheads with some of the people and say, look, you have somebody who may be excellent in working white collar crime. Maybe in their past life, they were stockbrokers. Maybe they had their license to do that. Now you want this person at the end of the course to be classified as an undercover. You can't. You can't put that person in a social mob club. You can't put that in a bikers club. You can't put that in a Black Liberation Army group. Right. You can't have people who are buying, you can't have that person buy dope. They're not comfortable. So you have to know what your limitations are. I, like you said, there's no way I would ever do uh, images or pornography with uh, children. That just would not, it, it's not in my chemistry. I couldn't do that. And also white collar crime. I felt a little bit uncomfortable with that. You know, I was more of a street guy, like a boss type of guy. I ran with a crew of some other undercovers, which were amazing. And, and that's how I was comfortable. And I could do it with my eyes closed at the end because I had so much practice of it. You know, mine wasn't a one-shot deal. I mean, I worked over 100 investigations. So I was buying dope all the time on the street and back in the Badlands. So, you know, that's where I feel comfortable. But it was not for everything. It's not for me. This is just what I liked. One of the cases that you talk about, and, and we're going to get into the Palma and that in a minute, but I wanted to talk to you about that case you just referred to in the Badlands. And being from the Philadelphia area, Look, I've been to the Badlands many times. Obviously, now it's a place where many people just don't go outside of people that are looking to cop or whatever. But, you know, back then, you've, you've had these colorful characters. And a lot of people just assume in Philadelphia it's, you know, gangsters or whatever. But in North Philadelphia, there is a thriving, as we know, drug trade uh, and one of the most lucrative in America. Uh, but back then, in the 80s, there were these colorful characters of Latin descent that really thrived in those neighborhoods. There was an individual you kind of worked on as far as the case. Tell me about that individual and kind of what the case is all about. Okay, Philadelphia was really a, an eye-opening experience for me. Uh, having been in New York and then coming there, it, you're right, Jeff, there's a cast of characters there, okay? This particular guy who wound up becoming our informant and the guy who I palled around with, and we actually even set up a business on 7th and Cambria. So you being from Philly, you know what a shithole that is, okay? Well, it was just 10 times worse back then. So there was drug dealing on every corner. Every corner was controlled by a certain group of drug dealers and everybody collectively got together and they went to this place, El Kibuk restaurant. It was a Cuban restaurant on North 5th Street. And there it was uh, the guys who owned it were actually drug dealers. So everything was just covered in, in, in drug deal. The, the guy who we were able to pal around with and that we were able to flip was a guy named Tony Oro. Now in Spanish, Oro is gold, and that's what his nickname was. He drove a Rolls Royce. He had all diamonds in his fingers. He had a chain with some Inca god that was all encrusted in emeralds and diamonds. He ran the largest bookie operation in North Philly. He had all the numbers, the loan shark. He was getting money off to the mob at the time um, for his gambling debts. They were betting these drug dealers to the tune of 30, 40,000, a baseball game. It was amazing, and I've seen this. So what we did is we actually put a, a camera in the place. He had horse shows. They were actually ca uh, TVs where people would have live feed with satellite to bet on, on the horses. All these guys were drug dealers. We were able to not only identify them, but also do deals with them where it came with either money laundering, where we took their used money and converted into brand new $100 bills in order so the dogs don't get a cent, or we were able to buy kilos of cocaine. I must have made myself and the other undercovers who did this together, one guy named Jerry Peters and Van Marsh, we did a total of maybe 50 drug buys over a kilo. Uh, Money-wise, we converted a couple of millions, five or six, and we would do is we would follow the transaction to where it was going, and there we investigated that particular individual, 
And at the end of the case, I think we took down 100 drug dealers and we were able to seize the majority of the money that we converted on it. It was a very successful case, but guess what? The next day, drug was still available in Philadelphia. So even though we were able to get a lot of these major drugs, including the supplier at the El Kibuk restaurant, we were able to shut it down. They find another place. Drug was all over the place. And you look at 20, 30 years later, uh, no drug corner in Philadelphia has been shut down for an extended period of time, as far as I know. And it's interesting because I think it was about two years ago, I don't know if you heard about it, in the port of Philadelphia, there was a billion dollar drug seizure. Wow. You could still go up to 7th and Cambria and cop that night. It didn't matter. Yeah. Well, what I, yeah, what I found too, Jeff, is that Philadelphia is more like a consumer town. You may get guys who are dealing 10, 15 keys compared to New York. When I was in New York, we were dealing with pretty much cells, people who had their own cell from the cartels. So they dealt in over 100, 200, 500, 1,000 keys. Here, it was smaller, but that generated more money for them. And not only were they able to take that kilo, but cut it down and sell it on the street, which generates a heck of a lot more money than just doing a brick to brick that may get you a thousand, two thousand, and not. But even back then, when I was in Philadelphia, I worked a joint case with a DEA agent, and we I met this guy who was a, a, a big, big money laundering for launderer for the cartels. He, um, his name was Carlos Brito. I remember him. He was an older guy, maybe in his late seventies, and the guy winds up telling us that Colombia was now getting into the heroin trade that they got these poppy fields, and they brought in some Chinese chemists to start producing this heroin. Now, we go back to the office and say, hey, this is what this guy told us. Now, the office is going, no way, Colombia doesn't, they get it from either Pakistan or China, it doesn't work that way, they don't, I said, I'm just telling you what the guy, so me and him, the, the other agent, I think it's Frank Marrero, we said, hey, you know what, only way to have these people prove, we'll go talk to the guy, put in an order. Sure enough, we put in an order, we got a taste, and it came back that the heroin, as you know, flooded the market, not only in Philadelphia, but throughout the world. They wound up selling heroin at a discount price that was even more uh, pure than the heroin that was originating from China and or Pakistan and, on, and those countries, Afghanistan. So the, that's the, the original part of, of um, the, when the cartels started dealing with coke. Now, when I asked the guy, why are you doing the heroin, is they said because it, you make more money with the heroin and as opposed to, let's say, do a thousand kilos where I could just do a hundred kilos so it's easy for them to smuggle, to transport, as opposed to large numbers like it would be container fulls of, of, of cocaine and stuff, like, or weed for that matter. When you look back on, and, and this is a question that I think can toe the line, but I'm curious. When you look back on all the work you did in the drug trafficking trades, that kind of stuff, do you feel like morale-wise you were just sweeping leaves on a windy day and that you said ultimately it didn't really put much of a dent in, did it? No, uh, yes, Is you're that right. Was a problem, I mean, morale-wise for you? No, in the morale-wise, no. Actually, it was great for business because there was nothing better like, hey, who are we locking up today and how much we dope and money we're taking off them? So that in itself was fun because, okay, we had, a, we had so many informants. This guy just came with a shipment. Then we hit the house or else we flip it. I did a lot of these things called buy bus. A guy would bring in a guy. I lock him up with dope. Then he flip, and then he would then give me his guy, and he flip. And we try to figure out the latter. So we were always very busy. And when I was working in New York with dope, not even in Philadelphia, which as you know, North Philly is bad. We were in Jackson Heights, which is little Columbia. Mm -hmm. And there we were just rocketing. The, the part about it that bothers me about the drug trade is that today the FBI does not even investigate, at least to my knowledge. I know it didn't when I retired. They don't investigate drugs like they used to. We used to have about seven drug squads. Miami had about 10 or 15. Now, 
I don't think they have them. Their investigative priorities have changed. It's now more cyber, it's now white collar crime, it's now foreign counterintelligence, there is no OC, there is no uh, narcotics, and there's narcotics everywhere. Right? So you, you, there's narcotics everywhere. So why is the FBI not working it? I don't know. Maybe it's manpower allocation. Maybe it's resources. Do you think this country's given up on it? Uh, you know, I hate happened. to say, I think, I think, yes, I think we gave up on it in the Bureau because as far as we were concerned, the squad that I was on, we had 20 New York City detectives. I mean, these guys were the creme de la creme. We had 20 agents. Okay, that was just one squad. We were known as C-13. And then there were five or six other drug squads. We led not only the New York office, but the total FBI in most arrest, most money seizure, most dope seizures. Okay? And this was like a, an everyday thing. I mean, it, it was amazing. We went into work and we just put people away. These people were so talented that we had in, in our office. There was always constantly... And I was blessed because I'm the Spanish speaker. So I wound up doing a lot of the undercover work. So to me, it was a great place to go work at, actually. But I think now, when you abandon it, and I get these other investigative priorities, terrorism, I I'm totally understand that. But hey, this drug situation is still a problem. Oxycontin is still a problem. I bought every type of drug there is. I mean, I've bought. Coke, ecstasy, heroin, uh, you name it, I, I weed. We bought tractor trailers of weed. But it, it's something that you see happen there all the time, you know. And now it's no longer, maybe it's a local thing where maybe the DEA or the NYPD investigative squad is doing it, but we're not, you know. And look what's happened with the OC world. Yep. We had five of the best squads in the world. You know, we had every family being covered. Now there's only, what, two squads? Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you? Are we devoting our time to organized crime? No. Or are we just, and, and what's organized crime doing? They're learning from this. They're going back to their roots. They're morphing themselves, realizing, hey, this is what the FBI does to us. They're going underneath the rocks. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that is being a secret criminal society. I want to get into your OC stuff in just a second, but I have to ask you just day-to-day -day stuff, and I'm curious about two questions on your actual undercover, you know, early work, let's say. And this might be a dumb question, but I have to ask. So in the movies, in TV, when a individual meets another individual to sell weight to, right, they do this thing where they try the drug, and they almost <laughs> test you to make sure you're not a cop. Were you ever put into those situations where... No, no, I, I've never was. And I'll tell you why. And that's where the difference in the undercover world of the feds are to the local street cops. To local street cops have the toughest job because they're making buys on the street. And guys on the street are users. Guys on the streets have all kinds of issues with them. Of fries, right, exactly. So they're doing all of that. They're all make-believe lawyers, too. Uh, you know, I bought, when we first started getting into dope, we started all of that. And we would meet guys who would say, well, I'll ask you, are you a cop? Because you have to tell me. And if you say no, and you arrest me, then I'm walk. I mean, this stupid jailhouse thinking that they have. We don't. I, the people that I've met throughout my career, and I worked a lot of dope cases, okay, they did it as a business. You know, I've met with 80-year-old people, guys who brought in thousands of keys. It was a business. No one would ever say to me, hey, you want to taste? And if they did, I knew the answer right away. I would look and say, look at me. I have a taste. I'm on the floor. I'm dead. They think, hey, I can't go with that. Perfect response. Right. It, 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 they're not going to question that because they know my heart rate. And the thought well, with those guys is we're not, in, in common knowledge, we're not fucking junkies. Right. Right. Exactly. And the people that want, right. Well, you know, we don't sell it. We're really buying, but sometimes we do what they call a reverse on the cover right. where we post to buy, to sell, and we catch the guys and some people will do that. But what I would do with the key, because I saw so much dope in my life, I just make my little triangle, pull it, 
and I could see it was fish scale. I mean, you know right away from the smell, you know right away by the glow. So I didn't, you know, for a guy to go like this, taste it, you don't. Know, but what you do, if you're like a guy like me buying tons of it or whatever, I would make the D, I would pull it out, I would take a knife and dig in deep. Because sometimes in Spanish world of dope, they call it un tumbe. Tumbe is a rip. So what they'll do is they'll put sh shit in the bottom middle right. and then they'll cover the sides with real coke. Right. I mean, everybody's got to hustle. So when you dig in there, you look at it and you would see if it glistens and you would see that it was fish scale, then you know you were dealing with. But that was the only kind of fear we always had. It was the fear of the rip, you know, like uh, it's some, uh, some of the people out there make a living on that and uh, they're very dangerous. They could care less. In fact, if, as you know, in my book, I talk about the nine kilo nightmare, which was some gang bangers I met in Queens and they set up the drug dealers and me, the buyers, and they were going to take his boat down and uh, it, it, it got ugly. We wound up arresting them and then one of them cooperated and said we were going to take the big man's money and they were going to take the dope from the Colombians. So besides being that it's a risky world and selling with cops undercover out there or investigating, among themselves there is no honor. These guys are, are notorious for rips and notorious for even buying police raid jackets and claiming to be cops and robbing you. There's, there's just, uh, it's an ugly business to get into. They do what they have to do to survive. Let's get into, I think, your most well-known uh, undercover opportunities were, you know, let's just be honest, the mob. But I want to ask you, you got into a Atlantic City case involving Asian organized crime. And this was kind of the early connection to the OC people, right? Or that happened kind right. of around the same time, right? It was right around the same time, maybe a little, a little earlier. Yeah, that was an interesting case, too. It was called Royal Charm, and uh, it dealt with uh, Chinese importers who were bringing in truck, truck loads as well as container loads of cigarettes, counterfeit cigarettes, as well as they had access to counterfeit uh, medications. Any, like the guy told me, anything you want done, whether it's Callaway Golf Clubs, whether it's a Rolls Royce, just give us the car, give us the thing you want duplicated, and we'll duplicate it for you. So this is what was going on. And he described it, how in China they shut down these little provinces, and everyone collectively works. And the reason why they come in with 40-foot containers is because they charge the same freight for a 40-footer as they would a 20-footer. So they're saying is I got to pay the same for a 20-footer, I must as well throw more stuff in it for 40, make it worthwhile. But the cigarettes were pretty much undetectable. Yes, there were times when you hear, oh, the cigarette is stale. It, it was mostly, it looked, the packaging, you couldn't discern it. I mean, it was that well done that they did. And I'm talking about every product. But what brought us in, there was two things that piqued our interest. Number one, super notes which are $100 bills made in the same machines with the same paper, the same ink as that we make here in America. Now, that raised everybody's you know, eyebrows. So what we did was, and they were working in concert with North Korea. What we did was, I, we asked for, it was myself and Luke Calvary's was the other undercover, um, I asked for a sample. And sure enough, we got it. Bureau looked at it, looks good to us. Secret Service to work with us, looks good to us. They sent it to the lab and they said, no, this is fake. So we went into a panic because just think what they could do to our economy if all of a sudden these $100 bills are undetectable. So we came into an agreement with them in Atlantic City. I remember being this huge suite that we got and came to an agreement that we would get 30 cents on the dollar to them with the proviso that we have sole exclusivity. So in the distribution of the money, that seemed to appease them, they were happy. Now at the same time, while the guy was bragging about all the things we could do, we said, well, what about weapons? Well, sure enough, they were talking about any kind of weapon you can do, and they even provided a book listing all the weapons. 
and say, you pick the weapons you want and we'll send it. And it had tanks, missiles, and guns, you name it, it had it. But what happened is it's all about, life is all about timing. At that time, there was that uh, terrorist attack, I believe, was in Spain. And because of that, they got freaked out with the possibility that these weapons are now going to be scrutinized, these cargo containers, and it kept delaying and delaying. And, of course, we got to a point like five years working this case that, you know, we got so much on these people that we, you know, we got we to gotta eventually pull the plug. So they came up with this fantastic scenario. The undercover agent, uh, the main undercover agent, Luke Calvary's, was getting married to a female agent. I was going to be the best man. And it was a party in the casino, so we invited all the subjects. And they came in all wearing tuxedos, and they came in, and of course, limousines picked them up, took them right to the FBI office, locked them up. And it was this fabulous wedding that never happened. And they believed our story so much that they even said, well, they're arrested. Does that mean those guys, are they getting married? How come, where are they? Are they getting married? They're probably on their honeymoon. And it's like, dude, we're not, we're not getting married, you know? But anyway, it was a fabulous case. And the other interesting part is there was another case similar to this. It was kind of jointly being worked in L.A. called Smoking Dragon, and they too were involved in super notes and weapons. So we were we really hit them pretty hard. Pretty hard. But uh, that was a it was a fun case because I got a lot of opportunities to go to Atlantic City and also see how. And I'm talking about 2005. And so intellectual properties have been ripped off from China for even way before that. And the fact that they were able to smuggle, and the guy was telling us when we also asked him for drugs, which they said they could bring in with diplomatic pouches. Now, figure that out. They said, well, why do we want to get involved with uh, drugs when we're making more money with cigarettes? And they would have these counterfeit cigarettes, and what's the violation for that? There's really, and there's no penalties for that that much compared to drugs. Right. So it was like this whole enterprise of... Uh, uh, of huge money making and corruption that took place uh, in China and God knows where else. But uh, the case uh, was a fantastic case and uh, that kind of ran at the same time or towards the end of as I began the mob case. So the mob case, the bureau comes to you, right? And they say, we want you to play a mobster. And you say, well, I'm Cuban. I'll never pass, right? How does this start and how do you meet uh, let me bring him up, this uh, individual. There he is, Greg De Palma. So we'll start at the beginning. How does this happen? Does the FBI come to you and they want to get Greg? What is this? Well, okay. how they came to me quick. is, sure. Real quick. So at the time, John Jr. takes over uh, once Sr. goes away. This is late 90s. Uh, ultimately, he would get arrested with De Palma and his son uh, and go to jail. And Peter Gotti takes over, and they have that whole thing. So you kind of come in around that time. Correct. Yeah. Um, well, what happened was the case agent was this guy, Nat Parisi, who himself is Italian. Uh, and he came up to me because I had worked a case with the Russian organized crime group up there in Brooklyn. So he comes up to me, and says, listen, we got this source. He owns a strip club to being shaken down by the Albanians. He says, we're looking for a guy to come in with experience, who shows, you know, been around, a little older guy, kind of knock-around guy, and see if you could find out what, more about this Albanian gang, which was Alex Rudaj and company. Yeah. So they were going into the strip club and demanding a shakedown. They wanted money on a regular basis. They kept coming in, drinking for free, partying for free, not paying for anything. You know, your typical thing. Then demanding money. So they said, we think you're the guy because you're older, stay out of trouble that way, and I work with you in the past, et cetera, et cetera. So I go in, and we're targeting the Albanians. Sure enough, uh, you know, I'm shaking hands, meeting people. Now, none of this had happened during those early stages. But, of course, when I was in there, supposedly the Albanians came in, 
and then they started demanding money now they started beating up on some of the bouncers the patrons just destroy the whole place making all these demands the source said look we got to do something with this and we got to do it fast because they're going to take my whole business down and I'm not paying these guys so as the bureau is figuring out what to do in comes Louis Filippelli who is the uh, nephew of Arnold Scutieri. Now he comes in and he says, hey, we heard you had a problem with these Albanians. Well, we could make that problem go away, but now you got to pay us. So it was your classic create a situation and offer a solution, aka extortion case. So obviously they must have been working in hand. You know, we'll mess up your joint and we'll fix it. We're so, the of two evils. Right, exactly. Now, we said, wow, this whole different light, you know, what are we going to do here? We're back and forth with this. We said, okay, so I now take a more of a lead and I, and I pay Filippelli and his guy, which is Chris Sucarato, I pay him five grand just to keep the Albanians away. And in the tape recorder, we said, listen, we're giving you this money. I says, we're hurting financially here. I says, after the fight, who's going to come in? We're losing our businessmen uh, base. They're not coming here because they're going to get slapped around. They saw what happened here. You're, now it is, I won't be able to pay you for some time. And sure enough, we hook our wagon to Louis Filippelli. So now we are pursuing Louis. Now, behind the scenes, Greg De Palma is coming out of his jail stint for the scores case. So he comes out, not the next day, not the next week, the next month, or the next year. That same day, he drives right to the strip club that was under his, uh, under his umbrella before he went away. And he says, hey, I'm back in business. Now you got, you know. So... We told him, we said, look, Louis Philip goes, don't worry about that. I'm handling that. Now, Greg comes back. I mean, Louis Filippelli comes back, and he doesn't tell me. He tells the owner, he says, hey, listen. He says, um, what it is, what it is. Greg De Palma is back. He's got his stripes, and you have a choice. You could either be with me, or you could be with him. So we, the FBI, chose Greg for one reason only, because Greg likes to talk, and we in the FBI like to listen. Right. So we hitched our wagon to Greg, but then we realized that, oh, man, this could be a problem. This is where I was a little bit concerned, because if you remember, Jeff, while he was in prison, he then gets a hard-on for Nicky Sorsa, which is a mate guy that he himself proposed to be made but was not feeding him money while he's in jail to his wife so he decides to tell this to some drug dealer in prison who is in a wheelchair and he's all wired up so they tells the guy I want him whacked can you do it so they bring in some I think it was ATF they bring some agent in and they record this conversation of Greg wanting to whack Nicholas Sorsa. His exact words were, that fat prick, I'll show him a thing or two. <laughs> that was it. Very good. <laughs> Very good. So Nicholas Sorsa then, what do you call Greg De Palma goes, to, which, you know, Greg De Palma, say whatever you want about Greg. But he was from the John Gotti mentality uh, era where, hey, no matter how bad you got me, I'm taking you to trial. I'm not going to plead out. You know, he only pled once, and he told me the reason he pled to the Scores case is because he was told to plead in the Scores case. So anyway, so Nicky Lasorsa, uh, he goes to trial. He's acquitted. Now Greg De Palma is out, but we're concerned, what's Nicky Lasorsa going to do? Right. Because if I'm Nicky Lasorsa, I got a major beef with Greg De Palma. Try to kill him. Exactly. So I'm sitting in restaurants with my back to the wall facing that door. You're always worried about it. Exactly, because I'm saying Nicky Lasorsa. I looked at every picture of Nicky Lasorsa. I could describe him to a T. 
because I said he's coming in and he's going to take care of business because of what he did. So all through my early part of the investigation, Craig kept saying, I'm being told that I got to make nice with him and I got to do something. I got to wind up talking. He actually, I wound up like a month or two later, along with the source, driving him to, as he said, uh, Jojo Carrazzo's kid, the lawyer, his business, where he was told that, hey, you guys got to kiss and make up. So that's where Greg was with La Sorsa. And the bottom line, he was angry at him because, number one, La Sorsa was kicking up money to his wife, to Greg's wife. And number two, which is the best ever, is that he wasn't collecting at Valvella's, which is a exclusive restaurant in Connecticut, and where all the celebrities go to dine, right? And what Nicky LaSorsa was doing, he was hanging out at Valvella's like a big, you know, like a big chooch, you know, bringing people in for business, talking here, buying champagne, ordering Cristal, ordering Chateau Lafitte, uh, Rothschild, yeah, blowing money left. To, and that angered Greg because, A, he couldn't go there because he was in prison, and two, he wasn't getting any money for that. Right. So that was kind of the big beef uh, uh, with them, too. I have a question on Greg, but I want to backtrack just quickly to the Albanians because I did a video on the Albanians. I've, I'm Albanian myself, so I've always been very fascinated by their continued obsession with Italian organized crime. And we know at one point the mob had a real problem with the Albanians, and there was either one way to deal with them, diplomatically or wipe them off the face of the earth. And the Genovese family at one point, I think it considered that, and Lucchese's as well, pa uh, Patsy Falcetti, a Genovese capo, said at one point, I hate these fucking Albanians. I hate them. If you have a beef with them, you have to kill them right away. There's no talking to them. Now, Arnold Squitieri, who I did a video on, kind of took the different tact with them. But you would agree, they were people that Squitieri ended up kind of almost, and it almost led to some crazy shit with that gas station meeting. But um, the Gambinos did a decent job with kind of repelling them, didn't they? And they ultimately went away for, for other crimes. The government hit them pretty hard. Um, just kind of finish on the Albanians. What kind of people were they? Did you ever meet Rudai or anybody like that? No, I, I saw them. But let me tell you what I do know from what Greg has told me about it is I got the impression that the Albanians were working with the, with the uh, Italian organized crime, with the mob, with Cosa Nostra. And they realized that if you hired the Albanians, that, what does that say about you? You're kind of weak. Why don't you clean your own house? Why don't you have problems? And what bothered Greg the most was an incident that he said happened up in Queens in Astoria when they took the, one of the Gambinos, which I'm assuming had to be Joe, yep. maybe, or maybe John, yeah, right. beat him up, ripped all his clothes off, and took his wallet. Right. And Greg kept saying, that cannot be allowed. That is a no-no. Why didn't anybody do anything about that? So they were losing their strength and their respect. And I think that's when Arnold decided that, hey, this has got to come to an end because we can't have these renegades. So that's when these 20 guys went and supposedly they were all were strapped and they all went there. And then supposedly one of the Albanian guys had a shotgun aimed at the, at the gasoline pump. And uh, Arnold told them, as Greg would say, he goes, you took what you took, but you ain't taking no more. That was it. He goes, we're not going to deal with this anymore. And Alex kind of agreed. And from then on, it became like peaceful. But the Albanians were a very serious, various group who really were out there causing mayhem and destruction. And, and they didn't even give a shit who you were on record with. They just enough. went in and took it. As you know, they would ultimately all get jammed up and get indicted and go away. But there was about 10 years ago, there was a big fight in Danbury involving Albanians from that group and gangsters over that Gambino thing. They ended up getting some payback for that years later. And that was a story that I've seen. But let's get into De Palma. He would be the subject you would pal around with. Did you kind of realize quickly this guy was going to be a treasure trove of info? All I got to do is sit back and listen. Um, you know, it's funny. When I take on an undercover role, I just don't want to take everything. I just want to just get the generalities because otherwise, 
you know, it may be, you know, a little bit confusing or I may slip, you know. But I was warned about Greg. I was told in advance, and it was so true. He's a celebrity gangster in his own way. Number one, he, he was just a, a guy that was recognized everywhere we went. I mean, legitimate citizens would come to our table and reminisce about the Westchester Premier Theater, about the great time they had in the Frank Sinatra show with Dean Martin or... The, like the picture shows, they would just reminisce the great dinner and are you going to open up another place? And oh, I could remember, we they, every the who's who of entertainment played at the Westchester Premier Theater. Now what Greg would do is he would hit them for a business card and right away when they leave, he looks at it and goes, okay, this guy's in carpet. He goes, yeah, I'm going to call this son of a bitch. I need carpet. You know, his mind was always, what am I going to get from this guy? And I'm sitting there watching these people, like, pay compliments to Greg. And I'm saying to myself, get away, run. You have no idea this guy is a lunatic. He'll suck your life out of you, you know. And, and that was Greg. He was well known in the community. And sometimes what was the thing about Greg that I found him as a good adversary at times. And I do know that he ran his mouth and he was his own worst enemy. But then again, you can look at John Gotti and say, look at him running his mouth. So wh what I found about him was that whenever I gave him a tribute payment, or he made a score with me that we set up through the FBI, is he would always, as you know, money always flows up in the mob. He would give extra. A lot of these guys, as you know, bitch and complain, why is this guy taking my money? Why do I got to kick up so much money? Greg felt that the more he kicked up, the more later on he could call on that marker to save his ass. Very tactical. Right. So he was very good at that. So if you give him like $100, he may give Arnold 80 bucks. So he'll do 20 But you know what? Arnold will like him because it's all about money with these guys. And that's so, one thing about, real quick, that's one thing about Greg that I've always found interesting because he was not a leg breaker, as, as you will tell us. He was not a guy, and a lot of people try to take advantage of him. Obviously, someone like uh, Petey Chops did at one point, Nicky Lasorsa. A lot of people kind of looked at him as kind of this, well, he's not going to do anything to me. Look at him in this picture. But look at this picture. Look who's in this picture. Frank Sinatra, yeah. Carlo Gambino, Paul Castellano. I mean, these are higher-ups. And he was always in the good graces because he knew all the money he was getting was way more anyway. That just Let's just I'll, I'll, I'll grease in the people that matter. And, and at the end, I'll always make it through. A absolutely. And, you know, he did. He stepped on his crank many a times, but he's also at the same token, he was able to somehow survive. You know, he survived the, Nick, the Nicky LaSource incident. He, you know, all of these things that he's done, you know, in the past. But, look, a lot of these guys, maybe he wasn't a leg breaker, but here's something I've always thought. Who, whose crew was Greg in? It was a Nino Gaggi's crew. Right. Who was in Nino Gaggi's crew? Man. The biggest killer in the mob. Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself, you don't think this guy went once on some kind of dig a hole or put the car in some conspiracy? I know I try to pitch Greg on something like that, and his response says, we don't talk about it. You know, he talks about everything else, but that, that thing he never talked about. Now, whether he was capable or not, I don't know, but he certainly was a money maker because he made money in the Westchester Premier Theater, these construction companies that he was shaking down. I mean, he was buying dirt companies and et cetera. So Greg, Greg was always kind of a money maker. And I think some people realize, even Nino Gaggi said that he's got a big mouth. But, you know, it, it was his personality. He knew, he knew a lot of people, he knew a lot of old timers. I remember going to Rudy Santabello's uh, social club. And I was up there a couple of times that he had up in, uh, in right across 238th Street in the Bronx. And uh, Greg, he sent his regards, told Greg I said hello. And so was Scott DeLuca from the Genovese, uh, was another guy who loved Greg, he used to hang out with Greg all the time. So he knew these old timers, and these old timers knew him um, which was kind of like you wonder, like, you know, telephone, telegraph, and tell Greg, but 
why are these old timers paying so much homage to him? You know, which was weird. I found that to be a little uh, curious, you know. You came in to the OC world at a fascinating time, right? Because you come in, and I talked about this in the Squateria video, kind of the, 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 the gaudy reign was long, but it wasn't really that long. But you had three generations. You had senior, junior, and brother, right? And brother was kind of a nut in his own right. But he goes away. Squateria kind of takes them through. I, I think Squateria was underrated just because he had to deal with all the blowback from the Gotti regime, and he kind of took them to kind of where their current state is, where it's a lot more underground. So the, the ruling body at the time, as you know, it was who? Squatiri was kind of the, the figurehead. Who were the other higher-ups? It time? was Tony McGalley as the uh, acting boss, and then the underboss, I mean, the concierge was Jojo, Jojo Carrazzo. Yep. Now, one interesting thing about that, so you know about... Scutieri, that was really fascinating. And you're right about that, because unlike the John Gotti Jr. and Senior Reign, and of course there's Dumb Pete, um, he wanted oh, Scu Dumb Pete, Dumb Pete the Peter Gotti, you know, yeah, his you brother. Allude, you allude on the name? The, uh, dumb Pete, a lot of guys called him dumb, because he was, you know, he's dumb. He's uh, No one had any confidence in him. He's a joke, you know. Um, so but, that, was a, that was a common, and I'm not, I'm not trying to act stupid. I know, I know the, what they're saying. I just wanted you to say because that's that's a common thing. A lot of people will tell you he was a smart, and I, no, he was in no <laughs> business. Should have been in the control. Of absolutely, that. absolutely, it really uh, took it down. But Scutieri, I think, was trying to, like you said, go back to his roots, go back to the roots of the Cosa Nostra, and that is to blow, blow the radar. Keep everything humble. Who did he have? He had Magali. Who else did he have? He had his nephew, Lou Filippelli. He ran errands for him. I'll give you another example. Greg will come up to me and say, you have no idea, Jackie Boy, what I've been through. And I go, what's the matter? He says, I've been up since 4 o'clock. I go, 4 o'clock? What happened? He goes, oh, I had to go see him. Next thing you know, I'm in a car. I'm driving to Manhattan. Then I'm going to the garage, park that car, get in another car, Drive downtown New York, looking around all in the meantime, get out of that car, go to another guy, cross the bridge, go wait two hours in this parking lot, then go to another place and me I met him. He said, this guy's driving me crazy. That's how careful he was. Yes, he was on parole, that's true. And, and number two, he didn't want, he, he just didn't want to meet anybody. I only drove Greg to a meeting with him. He never wanted to meet Greg would say he knew who I was, but whatever that's true or not, who knows. But he was very, very, you know, going back to, you know, not, not, hey, everybody, look at me. And if you remember, too, in the indictment that was interesting was that he shook down. Okay, the funny story was uh, Arnold Scutieri, as I understand it, is married to Alphonse Siska's sister. And Alphonse Siska's sister is married to, they're both, their sisters are married to one another, okay? Now, they decide to go to Las Vegas. So Greg, the consummate guy to score points with bosses, says, I got this, you know? So he comes to me, hey, would you put your card down? I said, what are you, crazy? I'm not doing that. So who does he get? He gets Gary Labriola. One of the nicest guy in the world. Gary Labriola is Liza Minnelli's manager. Okay? Now, Gary Labriola knows Greg for the Westchester days, I'm assuming. Next thing you know, we're having dinner. I'll never forget the a call comes in from Arnold and Funzi saying, they shut the car down. So Greg goes, what are you talking about? He says, no, they shut the car down. It's supposed to be platinum and it's, it's being you. They say they said no more. So I'll check it out. You just I'll call you back. He calls Labriola, begins to ream him out. Meanwhile, all of this is recorded. He reams him out and says, "How dare you? You do this to me. You know, you make me look embarrassed. What did you do?" He goes, "What did I do?" I said, "These guys are getting mani pedis every day. They're buying clothes at the shop. They're getting sauna treatments, makeup treatments." They, they ran 15 grand already, and it's only been two days. <laughs> so 
So Greg goes, I don't care what they ran. And Greg's came his line is, I'll pay you back, which she never did. So then he goes, okay, open it up for another 10. So sure enough, Greg calls, he goes, okay, you got to keep it down to like another 10. These guys went crazy on Greg DuPont. And this poor Gary Labriola, we were using him as a witness in the trial, but his lawyer said he was in France and he would not be coming back to the country and he would only testify with immunity. And I think the Bureau said, we'll give you immunity. And he says, no, I'm out of the country. Uh, nicest guy. He actually went to the same high school I did, graduated two years after me, and here I am, uh, you know, and I was kind of a visible kid in high school, and this guy is hanging out with us all the time, Gary Labriola, and couldn't put two and two together. So it's clear that these guys don't pay for anything. They no. use, use, use. Remember the saying, crime don't pay. That's it. They don't pay for anything. They all got alligator arms. That check comes in, they are in the bathroom, they're walking away. You got this. You got Never it. did I see Greg De Palma or his famous line was, I would drive him around and he would be picking up an envelope here, an envelope there. He's got envelopes coming out of his shirt, his back pocket. I take him home, he goes, Jackie boy, I'm exhausted. He goes, you got a couple of uh, C notes for me. You got a hunch or two? I go, what? Well, yeah. Are you kidding me? You're freaking loaded. You got more money than I got. Uh, thanks. I'm hurting. I got to do it. it it's, all, it's, all, it's so comical that you sit there and you go, I can't believe that this guy would actually hit me for money. And he would be a guy that I was selling him stolen stuff or what he perceived was stolen, which is really came from the FBI forfeited uh, vault. And he would make a killing. And he would say, Jack, he would call me up, Jackie Boy, like if I was down in Atlantic City or something. Jackie boy, I need those trophies. Trophies was his code word for watches because I would get a Rolex gold president and say I want 3500 for it and he'd sell it for like 6000 as he was six or eight, 8000 fazuls, as he would call them fazuls. Yeah. And, and that was his way of making money. So I was a money maker for him. Or if I had to go to Florida to work the cases that I was down there, I would come back and give him a tribute payment of a couple of hundred or maybe give them a thousand and it was all like about a money. Machine, yeah, and everybody in the crew did that. You gave him money like because he would always cry the money. I remember one guy came in, he was he had rugs that he knew and he's complaining he needs new rugs and he says, I don't know anything about rugs, you know. So then the guy goes, I'll get you these nice rugs, I'll put them in your house and then he shoots out the what's that really expensive rug? that, um, oh, there's a name. He knew exactly the rug. So he says, that's the rug I want. And I looked at him after and said, hey, Greg. I said, that was pretty good. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're asking the guy that you don't know anything about rugs, but then you, a Berber, that's what he called. He said, you hit him with a Berber rug. Like, I, I, what it, he goes, ah, he won't know. How would him? He treated everybody who wasn't in the life as you're a garbage can. Right. And, and that's kind of, get on you over yeah, he's out, you're out to make money, and that was it. And, but he was a, a full-time job, Jeff. He was a very exhausting guy, like all the mob. He was always, take me here, take me there. I got to meet a lot of sit-downs. There's a lot of ideas, always floating. They're going to do this. They were going to do the uh, uh, filtration at the golf club in the Bronx. They were going to do this. They are going to do that. It's never-ending projects, and their attitude was, hey, we throw ten, 10 turds on the wall, the one that sticks is the one we'll go with, you know? I want to ask you, you mentioned about Squitieri is very secretive, right? Very, you know, you meet me here, no talking, no this, no that. I want you to tell the audience about the, the TV uh, situation with, uh, with the phone call in the middle of the night with the TV. That was, that was a classic. What happened on the TV was, of course, we decided to sell some TVs. Now, I sold the TV to Andrew Campos, yep. which, by the way, we never charged, which I never understood. Because what happened with Andrew, we, he had that other case going, so we figured out, ah, let them have it. Telephone scheme. Right. So we were selling these hot stolen TVs. So Greg goes, Jackie boy, I says, we got to look good with the boss. We got to give him a TV. Plasma, get them the best you got. I said, all right, you know, I'll get them that. So 
I show up with the TV and uh, he didn't want to meet anybody, uh, Arnold. So bottom line was I get, we give it to Lou Filippelli uh, to handle. Filippelli then, I guess, brings it in. They mount it on the wall. So I would ask, hey, how does, uh, how does the boss, how does he like it? Does he like it? Oh, he loves the TV. It's great, Jackie Boy. You have no idea how good you look in his eye. Meanwhile, you know there was no Jackie Boy in there. That was old Greg getting all the credit for that, oh, right? Yeah. So a phone call comes in the middle of the night. And he goes, Jackie Boy, I need to see you right now. I go, what's the matter? He goes, now. I go see him. He goes, where'd you get that TV? So he goes, what do you mean where I got the TV? She says, where did you get the TV? I says, I told my boys from down in the Heights. He got it because it's just stolen. I go, Greg, what do you think? He goes, oh, I knew it. I knew it. You have no idea the problem that cost me. We had to go and remove that thing last night. The boss is going crazy. He says that I put him uh, uh, in jeopardy because he was watching The Sopranos when Robert Loggia as Feech LaMana is being a problem to the boss. And next thing you know, they set him up and they call the probation officer and they yank. Next thing you see is Loggia on the bus going back to prison. You know, it was a classic scene. And then I'm going to myself, wow, man, this is life imitating art, right. you know. Uh, or art imitating life. I don't, one of the two. It was amazing. And he uh, he never recovered. But the interesting thing is, when we did arrest Arnold Scutieri, the TV was back up. Really? But I heard, yes. And same with Louis Filippelli. He yanked his too. They were all nervous that they were going to get busted because of the Sopranos. So the Sopranos kind of put a handicap on us. It's so funny. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because one of the other Sopranos connections and relationships were De Palma and his son. Now, by this point, De Palma's son was, what, brain dead, basically, right? He was in... Carl, yeah. He, 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 in the Gotti Jr. case, he ends up attempting to hang himself at MDC. And from then on, Greg was kind of like a caretaker for the kid. He gets him a, a, a nursing home in, in, where, Westchester somewhere. And as Tony Soprano did in the show... He starts holding meetings at Green Grove, which was the fake funeral home or uh, fake nursing home. De Palma did that as well, as well, didn't he? Jeff, it was unbelievable. I saw that whole thing play out. Originally, Greg told me that his son was getting out. Now, his son was actually testified in the grand jury, but he testified in the Golds case in Atlanta with Mikey Scars in them. So what happened was, the way Greg explained it to me is that, not maybe it wasn't Greg, it was somebody in the crew told me that they, Greg set up something with the guards that his son and Greg would be on the same floor for a little bit. And Greg reamed him out and said, how could you do that to your family? Now, we could interpret that the De Palma family or the Gambino family. How can you do that? That made him supposedly destroy the kid. And then the next day, he was found hung in his cell. Now, I come in and I hear that he's getting a, uh, uh, what do they call those releases? A, uh, uh, a which one? Compassionate release. An impassionate, really compassionate release, right? And I didn't believe it. I'm saying to myself, hey, you know, this is going to be like the mafia flu. Just like when the old the mob guys show up with wheelchairs and masks and trial, you know. The rest of the time they're out dancing the Macarena, you know. So anyway, the guy comes in and he shows up and I see him. Bro, it broke my heart. He, he was in a vegetative state and you could just tell and Greg would talk to him. Greg had a full room all covered with stuff that he liked. He was into one of these rock groups. Maybe it was, uh, I don't even remember, ACDC, something, whatever. He had music going. He had a private nurse all around, and he would talk to his son. He would talk to his son all the time, and he would say, Hey, Jackie boy, I want you to meet my son. Hey, he's with us, Craig. Oh, this. And he loved Craig, you know. But the mother, his wife, was so mad at him. They would constantly get into fights saying, You made this happen. It was your idea to get him into life. And I tell you, it, it, what happened before even that, 
I went with Greg to the nursing home before they brought his son in, and he not only gave his word, but he guaranteed to the director of the nursing home that there will be no mob activity. That place was ma. We met there all the time. We went there all the time. We hung out there all the time. And you could just tell he was running amok. People there, and, and that's what kind of angered me a lot. Like, you would see the people there and their poor family. Uh, they're getting on in age and they're hurting. And you got to put up with all this mob bullshit. You know, guys hanging around, pulling up in the driveway with their Very fancy cars. It, it, was, it, it was kind of like, uh, you know, that, but that became the meeting place. I mean, we would always, because Greg was always there. You know, and uh, his other son lived out of state, and he would come visit him every so often. And, uh, you know, Greg was mad about him because he claimed that he was instrumental in getting that big Internet scam with Tori Lacasio and Andrew Campos, and he feel he was never compensated for that. But, you know, I, you know that's what Greg was saying. I've never been able to verify that. One of the issues, and you, you alluded to the fact that Greg De Palma was incredibly greedy. Uh, it was all about money with him. One of the other issues he developed was in prison, certain people were not uh, kicking up and paying their fair share. Um, this individual, Petey Chops, uh, he gets into a beef with Petey. And you wrote in your book, which, guys, I'm telling you right now, if you want a good book, people ask me all the time about mob books. The Making of Jock Falcone is terrific. I urge you to go buy the book, go check it out, get it on Kindle, whatever. You talk about an in, a, a situation where Petey Chosmachini owes Greg, and Greg wants to go collect. Greg finds out that Vicini goes to Bloomingdale's, into the mall somewhere, in White Plains, I think. And yes, Bloomingdale's. He has lunch every week with, with a lady friend of his. And you, you outline... Speaking to the waiter, you had no idea where the restaurant was. You finally find the restaurant, and Greg basically says, tell him what I just said about coming to see me at the nursing home. You then somehow get into contact with P.D. Vicini. Tell me what happens in this situation. Wild series. Yeah, that was a classic scene. I mean, uh, I get a kick out of that one because he, as, Kel as Greg De Palma would say, Vicini is a stone in my shoe. He says, I got to get this guy. He's out there under my umbrella, under me, and he's not kicking up. I said, that's not the way it works, Jackie boy. This guy's dodging me. So he had his own informants that said, hey, BD Chop, every Monday night, shows up with his kumad at Bloomingdale's. She goes shopping, and he hangs out in the coffee shop. So I said, really? Wow, that's pretty good. So one day, we're out there. He goes, Jackie boy, we're going. So he tells me and Robert Vaccaro and, and uh, Greg, we get in my car. Was, I, I drove a Hummer, right? So we drive a car. We go to Bloomingdale's. You know, we're marching upstairs. We're standing around. We saw the little restaurant. It's like a little place for sandwich and coffee, you know? So we're standing around. I go, Greg, what time is it? He goes, the guy's supposed to be at 6. Yeah, it's 10 after 6. And he goes on in his explicit. He actually said, quote, that cocksucker, where is he? <laughs> yes, that's, that's it. He was going like angry, like he needed to talk to this guy because he wanted to talk to him to collect money. He didn't care anything about us because he's in his crew and he's got to kick up. So finally, there comes Petey Chopped with his gumad and I guess a friend, okay? And Greg goes, here it is. So I said, okay. So Robert goes to me, stay here. So we're over there. Greg approaches. He goes, hey, will you mind excusing the ladies? Sure, go grab a cup of coffee. The girls go in the coffee shop, right? So Greg uh, says to him, where the hell you been? Because I reached out to you. You haven't called. He goes, what do you mean they reach out to me? He goes, I can't go. I'm being followed. Because you're being followed. We're all being followed. What bullshit is that? I says, you got to come in here. You're out there with my, under my supervision. I don't know what you're doing. You better show your ass tomorrow morning. You hear me? And you know what you got to bring with you. So he goes off on this guy. And next thing you know, the decibel levels start increasing and this and that. And Robert, which I've always thought is one of the most serious guys I've ever met, at least, you know, he's like t getting a little bit aggravated, you know. So he grabs a Costa Boda 
candlestick, which is this like, it feels like a, like a dumbbell. That's how high it is. So he says to the guy, shut your mouth, you know, and the guy says, oh, what? shut my mouth. Who the hell are you? You know, so he goes, shut your freaking mouth. And then he clobbers him, right? The guy's head just cracks open, blood is gushing, he drops down from the wall. Now, keep in mind, this is Bloomingdale's 6 o'clock, President's Day, jam-packed with people. They didn't care. This guy is down, and he's going to hit him again. So I, I grabbed it from Robert because I knew he'd kill him. So I said, hey, Robert, what are you, crazy, man? Look, this camera's in here. Let's get the hell out of here. I said, we're going to take a pinch on this. Oh, the hell with him. So this guy gets up, and he's bleeding profusely. So I go to him. I say, hey, pal, you better show up tomorrow or something along those lines. Next thing you know, battle, the yelling at each other. You better show up tomorrow. And Greg and Robert says, you better, you better show up. And they go back and forth on it. As Robert and I, so I'm pulling Robert and Greg out. They pass a table setting. He grabs a knife and he goes like, I go, what are you doing? And I took the knife off Robert. We get on the escalator and this guy is now following us. Meanwhile, I'm keeping them away because he's like, I'm sorry, I... What did you do that for, Greg? Why? He was like a little, you know, crying kid. Meanwhile, he's bleeding all over my leather coat, you know. And finally, we go downstairs. And just when we get downstairs, security is about to run up. And Greg Capama goes, see the guy up there? He fell down the escalator. He's going to sue you assholes. And we hurry up, get in the car, and we're driving away. Now, we get in the car. What made it interesting, number one, that was right across the FBI White Plains office. So it literally, where my car was, the office is right there across the street. So we get in the car, we're driving back, and, Gr and Greg says to him soberly, he says, Robert, you fucked up. I says, you shouldn't have done that. So Robert is shaking his head. He goes, you know you can't put your hands on him. You know you can't do that. Now we got to go and talk to him and tell him what happened, meaning Arnold. So what happened, he goes, but don't worry about it. He goes, yeah, but he was disrespecting you, blah, blah, blah. He goes, yeah, but you know what? He goes, don't worry about it, because if he's going to file a complaint, he's got to go through me. I'm his skipper. And if that's the case, don't worry about it. It ain't going to go nowhere. So now I'm saying to myself, we'll see what happens the next day. Next day, I'm bright and early at the, funeral, at the uh, nursing home. And in comes Speedy Chop with like old bandage. You look like Yankee Doodle Dandy, like bleeding. I'm with Robert in the car. And, I, and Robert goes, hey, there he is over there. And I go, you want to smack him a little more? So, or, and Robert just kind of like smiles. Ah, let him go. And um, he leaves and he's looking at us and he's being very cautious for cars. And then finally, uh, Greg goes, yeah, he came up. He gave me a few dollars, a few shekels, he called them. And meanwhile, of course, no money ever comes down. It goes up. You know, Greg made his money, and that's the end of that. Instead of maybe taking care of Robert Vaccaro, uh, but it was an ugly scene because I'm convinced Vaccaro would have hit him again. Right. And I don't think Ficini would have been around. You know, and uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of frightening because then the FBI, I, of course, I told them what happened. They go in, they interviewed all the things. They were saying, this giant guy, mob guy, meaning me, was there. And this other guy hits him with the head. And this poor guy was bleeding and careful. And then the women came out yelling and screaming. Uh, meanwhile, they only knew that it was like a mob uh, attack on one another. That's amazing. Yeah. So about three weeks later your assignment would end with Gregory De Palma, and ultimately he and 32 others would be indicted, including Squitieri. They would all go to jail for their crimes. How did the, the assignment end? Did the, the FBI basically say to you, okay, we have enough, that's that. How does, what is the last meeting with Greg De Palma like? Do you remember that? You know, as I wrote in my book too, Jeff, I was very disappointed in the way they ended this case, and I thought it was very short-sighted on the Bureau's part, because when 60 Minute did the episode, they, they kind of went the Bureau line saying that uh, uh, in as much as I didn't support the beating of PD Chops, I don't know, some convoluted thing. 
But there was really no reason for this case to end because my identity was not at all compromised. And what they were saying is that because I didn't hit the guy, they probably suspected me for not taking a few licks. That's not any way remotely true. I was still talking to them, hanging out with Robert and hanging out with, uh, uh, with Greg. What they decided to end this case for whatever reason, uh, and I, I, I'm pretty hard with the, not the Bureau, with certain people in the case. The people who wanted to keep this case going was of course Nat Parisi, my handling agent, Chris Munger, and all the assistant United States attorney that were working this case. Uh, Ed O'Callaghan and Chris Kniff, they said, let's keep this thing going, but they insisted on wanting to terminate the case. So I don't know why, and I fought them hard as well as the other agents, and also the assistant special agent in charge wanted this case to go because we got this opportunity to possibly get a guy made. We got the poss uh, opportunity to possibly bring in other undercover agents and infiltrate other families. And we also have this opportunity to take down everybody, you know, if we play this right. But these other guys had an agenda, and sure enough, they couldn't wait to get to the podium uh, in the press conference and tell that this was a call administration case because the, on the, the acting boss and the underboss were taken down and that's always a good thing, I guess, in investigation. Right. right, but my thing was always been, all the cases I've ever worked in the past, is everything is a ladder. And you keep going up that ladder till you can't go anymore. And here, I only felt we went through maybe one or two rungs. So, if, if I'm collecting the information correctly, you were prepared to be made. Is that correct? What, yeah, what happened was, many a times, and all recorded, Greg... Uh, said to me that he was going to be proposing me and he was going to put my name on, on a list. So I was, of course, playing, you know, dumb with him because I, again, my role was I grew up with the drug dealers in Miami, you know. So he said to me, yeah, well, he first asked me, have you ever, are you dealing in dope now? He said, no, not that. He, I said, no. He says, well, don't touch this stuff. You can't have any pro previous drug charge or anything for the last seven years for, I guess, statute of limitation. Which, which, which is fascinating because Arnold Squitieri literally was one of the biggest drug traffickers in the history of the Gambino crime family. And so was Magali. And right. so as the list goes on and on with guys who were dealing dope, Very funzy, uh, they all think it's a quick money. I mean, right. you could go down the line, but to them... Although I have to say, in fairness to to Castellano, he did not want that. He he felt that the the government could squeeze you harder on a drug charge than on an OC charge. So he asked me if I was, and I said no. He says, "Okay, well, I'm putting your name on the list." I said, "Well, what is that?" He goes, "It goes to all the families to see who uh, number one, who you're going to be replacing, because they'll list on one side the guys who've either." died or you know whatever and then your name would be the person replacing it and they want to know have you been uh with them before are you on record with any other family you got any dirty secrets that uh that could backfire like are you into kids are you into farm animals or whatever that will disqualify you and then after that you have your ceremony and he keeps bringing this up all the time he says uh and then I'll tell you when we're going to go someplace. You got to wear your uh, your best suit. And uh, he goes, uh, uh, "Don't be like your son," because the first question they ask you is, "Do you know why you're here?" And he kept saying, "My son." When he did it, he goes, "Yeah, I'm getting straightened out," which is why you shouldn't do it. But he was so proud that his son said that. So he goes, "You're not supposed to. You'll meet the boss, and you'll find out what this all is." So we got independent corroboration from some of our sources that this indeed happened. That I named the reason why it didn't happen when they were talking to do it around December was if you recall, right around that time or soon after, they, um, Joe Massino came out that he had cooperated with the government. So they went on a total shutdown. Right. Um, and that's kind of what they, uh, 
uh, were talking about. And then also I started like ribbing Greg. I said, well, Greg, let me ask you, what do I want to do that for? When the Because he used to get all pissed off about the Bonanos. He says, they're making all these guys right now. They're, they're not even worth it. I said, you got the Bonano guy stripping and, and doing the ceremony? I said, what kind of crazy shit is that? Why would you even make somebody if you doubt who they are? So, you know, so some of the rules about getting straightened out, Greg was objecting, especially the people that were getting uh, straightened out. So, now, I felt we should have continued with it. Again, my life or my identity was in any way um, compromised, and I think uh, it would have been interesting. And uh, I don't know whether... Um, um, I, I still don't know. Like, Joe Piston got six years. I did mine in under three. So why don't you let me, and I, I was even told the man, you let him do six, let me do another year. Let me at least see if I am going to get straightened out, because if I am going to straight out, I mean, the world is ours. I mean, we're in, we're now in those conversations where we're supposed to sit on another table. We're in the table right now. Plus, we can go in and create other Ruses like I got somebody in Kansas City looking to this and it turns out to be an agent or whatever we can get the case what we were able to do um, we were able to identify a lot of guys like on the chart uh, Filippelli no one knew who he was no one knew who Basili was um, he had just gotten out of prison no one knew who Vaccaro was so we were constantly identifying the new players that were flying under the radar, which in itself is invaluable because at least, or Vicini, no one knew, he wasn't even known who, who, uh, who Vicini was. And he was a guy who had an extensive record for gambling and loan sharking in the, in the Bronx, but more with the NYPD. So oh. I just felt it was short-sighted. But what am I going to do? I just moved on to another case, you know. And ultimately, remember, I mean, involved in this was the boss of the family. You know, they took a lot of heavy people down. Let me ask you. So it's interesting because back in the 60s, 70s, Jack Falcone would have had to have committed a murder, right? He'd have had to be made that way. But by this point, the mob was so watered down that just because you were able to make money, and this is what has gotten other families jammed up. I know in certain other cities, as long as you can make a little money, there's no credit check. They'll let you involved. If you can earn an envelope for somebody, that can get you made, and you didn't necessarily have to do that. So I feel like long term, it probably would have been uh, in the best interest to keep you involved because you didn't have to end up doing something. Yeah, and you're right about that because Craig specifically uh, had a conversation, I think it was with Robert or somebody, that he was saying that in the old days, he says, the reason why some people killed was because, and they felt that they had blood in their hands, so they would not cooperate. But where does that get you? <laughs> Look at Sammy the Bull. He's got 19, and, you know, so that theory went out the window. So what Greg said to me is, listen, you could be called upon to do something. And I go, well, what does that mean? He said, well, you could be digging a, a grave. You could dig a secondary grave. You could be the crash car. You could be only that. But we want earners. Like you said, earners is the way that they were looking for. Because let's look at now. Where is the, the mob operates on fear, on bringing fear. But when you have all of these ex-mob guys out with their own podcast, all of these guys since Henry Hill who've been out publicly going out there and nothing has happened to them, what? and when you weigh into that, what they, they're more fearful of the government coming with them with a RICO statue than they are among themselves. So what is the fear logic? So all they want to do is now is make money. The, the killing of people, uh, there's a lot of guys that, Jeff, I don't have to tell you, old timers who never whacked anybody, never got blood in their hand, but they were either earners or, or, or something. A lot of people, Hollywood, I think, has romanticized that, right. where, you know, you got to kill somebody and all that. Maybe if they need shooters, maybe if they need that. But uh, in this particular case, I was being looked at as an earner, which Greg saw that. And he saw, like, I guess, a mature older guy who could make things happen, you know. Now, ultimately, the case would end, as you said. Uh, Squitieri would get seven years. And he actually is still alive today, interestingly enough. He actually just died recently. I'm 
I apologize. Died about two weeks ago. I should have remembered that. But, um, you know, Greg would actually die in 2009. Um, a lot of these guys w would um, kind of be dis extinguished and put away. And I'm sure, again, uh, Jack, you know, you and I, I'm sure we'll talk down the road on some other things. And we can go in so many different ways to this. But you know, obviously you're known mostly for what you did in your mob stuff. And I want to ask you about a couple of people. But before I do that, Greg De Palma was probably the most notable person you dealt with as far as the longest kind of experience you had. Do you ever think back and think about, do you ever like miss that, uh, that three years of your life? Did you ever find that fun? Did you, it, it, it seems quite regal and quite interesting. Did you ever develop a friendship with Greg? Like, how did you look at him ultimately? Well, you know, the thing is, is that I have worked undercover so many times, so many cases, that it doesn't, there was nothing in this that enticed me, like cars, I've driven every imaginable car there is, okay, from a Rolls Royce to a, a, an Ugo, a Yugo, so that doesn't, jewelry, I've worn that through all my career in all these cases, the lifestyle, I used to always carry like, you know, this big, uh, you know, a roll, I had to, with money so it isn't that you would miss that life I, I, i'll be honest with you what really troubles me is that how the mob is really romanticized and yet you look at the cartels and i have worked mexican cartels uh colombian cartels dominicans cubans the money and the violence that they have and they do and commit compared to the mob yet they have no Hollywood pizzazz. They don't, right. nobody cares about them. But then, you know, you look at things that happen in Nuevo Laredo where heads are cut off and put in fences and bodies are just destroyed. When has the mob ever done that? These are savages that are dealing that in these drug trade. I've and yet, been, real quick, yeah. I've, I've always been fascinated by it. I, I report a lot on. Um, the Camorra, the Andrangheta over in Italy. I mean, they make the, the American mob look like Boy Scouts. I mean, at the end of the day, I've always agreed. And that's something you and I have talked about. One of the reasons I started this show is to kind of explore why the mob is so romanticized, right? Because at the end of the day, when it comes to like transnational organizations, the American mob is very low on the totem pole, even in America now. So it's like, why does it move the need of the way it does? Well, I, I think the reason, I think when you and I spoke about it, is that it's the only kind of criminal organization that has infiltrated legitimate institutions. You know, I know the Colombians did when they, and you know, when uh, Escobar became a, but they've infiltrated the fish market, the constructions, the unions, and all, and that takes a lot of power to do that. And I think that's one of the reasons that they're mainstream they're out there. A lot of people and somebody, the mob does exist where, you know, the Colombians, the Mexican cartels, it's all about, for them, it's making money here and going back home. Right. Italians are here to stay. They live in they, these neighborhoods. They live here. So it isn't like, so I think a lot of it, people are not exposed to that. But, but if you were to ask me who I think was more violent, more money-making, I would say the cartels, by by no means. I mean, the mob has nothing on them, and the and the edict that the mob people that feel rather that well, the mob only kills people in their life. Well, look at John Favara. Well, what was he in the life? And look at those other guys at that restaurant who were killed right around when The Godfather came out the movie. They were innocent businessmen. They I were did a court. video on that about how that that's just not true at all. I mean, the mob kills a lot of people not involved, kids women uh, it's it's pretty incredible actually what they've done i want to ask you because we'll have you again on soon i don't want to take three hours out of your day but i want to play a game of the year i play it with people we have on i'm going to just show you a couple of pictures is there First a price thing, is there a price there is you can just speak to me <laughs> there you go there you go uh, all right so i'm going to put a couple of pictures up let me know what you think of these people um what about him what what, what, what are your thoughts on him you know uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, there's so much. Point with people in the life? Uh, no, actually not. John, of course, always stole the show. Everything was, and especially Greg. Greg uh, loved him. Greg talked about being in jail with him 
cooking for him and how he gave him a hat with the word chief because he liked to be called chief and he's treasured that and he said he would cook for him and take care of him and i remember even when we were out there he called the family and said hey i took care of him and they goes yes we know you did uh he he loved him he loved that man considering he was a paul castellano guy yeah. you know if you think about it he was made on the paul castellano so yet he has the guy who killed castellano as the guy who revered but sammy the bull was really not talked about i i hear more about him from legitimate people who and everybody is involved says the same thing how do you get out with 19 murders you know uh, and it, it is what it is he's got a successful podcast show by that? you know not really i mean there's some stories that make me think like there was one that he talked about roy de mayo and nino gaji got shot and somebody went in and pulled a bullet out of the guy and the guy was being looked at as a as a perp in a cop shooting uh, you know where are the uh, you know, so I don't know. I um, Sammy the Bull is an interesting character. Um, he got a sweet deal, and then he messed it all up in Arizona. Sure did. Uh, <laughs> I was going to bring John Gotti up. Um, Greg was kind of a he loved Gotti, right? Loved him. Loved him. Everything about him. He actually told me the story of the car, the Jaguar that Greg owned. And he, uh, John said, I love this Jaguar, it's the nicest car. And Greg goes, I give him the keys. So I said, wow, what did you do that for? He said, he's the boss. He Man, wants he was, that car. He was a brown noser, Greg. Oh, he see what, he, can he you imagine? He the game, though. You got to give him that. He did. He gave him a Jaguar XKE Red. And I think the Mob Museum in Las Vegas bought it from the Gotti family. And that was uh, Greg's car. He said he gave it to him because... And, he, and that's what's his whole mentality. What the boss says is the boss. You do what the boss says and you take care of the boss. Right. Fascinating. Um, what about, um, and I know you didn't, I don't know if you had many run-ins with him, but what, did, what was the everarching thought on, on him? Uh, well, I know, <laughs> personally, I think that he should have been released because Greg would have gone to him and hopefully we would have gotten him then but he also you know he beat you know he, they got that gaudy luck man he beat the the rap like his father did earlier on and uh you know uh as far as him being retired he i don't think i think he was chased and Let i me think ask you a question jack because because i think you're you're able to speak about this and I'm, I'm fascinated by your your answer here it's become widely known in OC circles, in street, in the streets, that Junior sat down and did a 302 with the government. Now, many people will say he didn't put anybody in jail. Um, can I ask you a question? Why on earth would he be in the box talking to anybody in the first place? Well, he. my understanding of that is that he proffered. And during the proffer, I, and you're right, the 302 is out there, and John Adelight made it available for all of us to right. look They're at. They're not happy about that. No, of course they're not. There's a brand. The Gotti is a brand and uh, uh, a name. And listen, for what it's worth, his father made it what it was. But if you sit down with the government for any type, whether it's a uh, proffer or not, it violates the tenets of being a rat. I mean, you rat if you talk. People are in their opinion that, well, you know what? I, like, I'll give you an example. Michael Francesi. Well, I didn't rat anybody in the life. Hey, but what about the other guys? That, Why were you sitting there talking to them in the first place? Right. I, it's automatically a rat. You know, it's, they, you know, the word is, I saw nothing, I heard nothing, and if you say I was there, I must have been asleep. Right. And that's that, how the father uh, saw things. You right. Know, I, uh, Junior says it all the time that he could steal the church a steeple with it sticking out, and he would say he didn't do it. John um, Gotti, <laughs> yes, he never pled guilty, and keep in mind, so did Greg. The only time Greg pled guilty was in the Scores case when he was told by his boss at the time, Gotti Jr. But in our case that we did, Arnold Scutieri called for a global plea. Now, global plea means everybody pleads out and it's nice and easy and painless. There was one person who did not get into the global plea, and his name is Greg De Palma. He did not want any part of that. Now, 
sure, we had the most overwhelming uh, evidence on him, but in, he could have easily pled guilty and done it, but that's not Greg De Palma. And I think when he pled guilty, when John Jr. told him to, uh, I think that bothered him because some of the old school mobsters, and you know what it is, and even with Arnold, you got to give him credit. He pled guilty to this case, but there was no allocution. And that drives them nuts when having to say, yes, I'm a member of the Gambino crime family because you're taking a secret society and bringing it to the forefront. So he did not allocute on his, uh, uh, his sentencing. So he, you know, maybe but, changed. But you know what's interesting, Jack, it, which, which is so fascinating because the next person I was going to ask you about, in 1990, the future underboss, Anthony Magali actually allocated in 1990 and ultimately became the underboss of the Gambino crime family. Right, but remember what John Gotti was, he was very angry at Tony. Saying, how does he become an underboss allocuting? Yeah. And that just I, goes I, to show you the level of where the Gambino family went under the tutelage of John Gotti. Many people allocuted and nothing happened to them. And the government says, I remember George Gabriel mentioned when Tony Pep Trenacosta allocated, Peter Gotti did nothing about it. And Tony Pep just basically was able to do what he did and that was that. There was no honor anymore. Yeah. The guys like Greg De Palma were few and far between. Yeah, they were, there was a lot of guys, uh, you know, the mob, as you know, has morphed itself. It's now uses business decision. There's no more fear. I mean, look, when you have all these guys out there with podcasts in the wide open, nobody's doing anything. I mean, but the mob learned that leaving bodies on the street is bad for business. They learned that celebrities are mobsters cannot be had. You can't taunt the, the bureau because they're going to come after you. Or you can't act stupid like John Gotti did when he had his Tuesday or Wednesday meetings with all his captains. They come in and shake his hands and kiss the ring, and the FBI is filming everything. I mean, come on, you got to use your head sometimes, some of these bosses. And I think that's what Arnold was trying to do. He was trying to bring it in, corral it in. But the pleading guilty, I mean, there are a lot of guys don't plead guilty, but you got to give the chin at least credit because he feels like, hey, you know what? Take a guilty plea and get back on the street and do what you do best, make money for us. Right. But if you go to trial, like with the overwhelming evidence, you're either going to be lucky like Greg De Palma was in prison, or you're going to be sentenced for a long time. That's a decision not too many stand-up guys can make. 100%. Last guy I wanted to ask you about, because I had an interesting story I wanted to run by to see if you knew about it. Uh, you know this guy, right? <laughs> Andrew Campos went to the same high school as I did. Andrew Campos was the quarterback, not for me, he was younger, uh, the same team that was uh, Puff Daddy was in. I wanted to ask you about it. I want to ask you quickly. Sure. The day Campos was arrested for the phone scam thing, Gregory De Palma is heard on wiretap, and this is according to Gangland News, quote, you know the guy who had him there with P. Diddy? He got pinched, you know, said De Palma. He then read the name of various family members and associates, including Andrew Campos. Now, they would put two and two together that Greg De Palma and Campos actually had set up a situation where P. Diddy was going to go to some Florida restaurant and show love to all these gangsters. Did you ever hear about Diddy through De Palma? Yeah, let me tell you a couple of things about that. That's interesting. Number one, the restaurant that um, I think it was Louis Filippelli and maybe Diddy had his hand, not Diddy, they opened up a restaurant near Rayos. So they wanted free publicity. So they went to, you know, Goomba Johnny to try to do it. Goomba Johnny says, hey, I nothing to do with this life anymore. So because they wanted to say, hey, you know, and they brought in Puff Daddy as a guest at this restaurant. Puff Daddy and Andrew Campos were very close. In fact, I met with Andrew Campos and I told you I sold him a television set, a stolen television set. Andrew Campos was a guy who, uh, at, the, at the high school, uh, rather, Robert Vaccaro, because it was a clique. It was Robert Vaccaro, Louis Filippelli, and Andrew. Now, Andrew was, wears a platinum diamond-encrusted watch, Rolex, that Puff Daddy gave to him. And supposedly, they used to go to the, to the recording studios together, 
My opinion, of course, I think he's on record, but, you know, that's, uh, nothing has ever showed up at all. Now, well, the really? interesting, you you, really? well, I mean, if you're going to be friends with somebody that powerful, well, what, are you just going to be friends? You know, it, it, that's, now, whether it's right or wrong, that's just my theory, but I tell you, I, I tell you an interesting story. When I was at, towards the very beginning, they knew I was from Florida. Puff Daddy was dating J-Lo again. Lou Filippelli and um, who was the other guy? I may say it was Andrew. Went down to Miami. Okay, this is the way he was told to me. With their gumads. And they bought a beard with them. Right? So who got the limo for them to travel to go see Puff Daddy and J-Lo was me, because I was a Florida guy. So now, we don't know if they did go there, but they were talking about it, because that's what Greg said to me. They're going down to Florida, he's the nephew, boom, you gotta take care of him. So they, um, they went down to Florida, they were very close, so I guess, like Greg would say, if he's going to go visit uh, Puff Daddy, then by all means, you know, Andrew knows them. They're, they're very close, you know, and, and uh, you know, whether they know each, whether he's on record or maybe they're just friends, no one's ever, I mean, that I know have looked into that, but, you know, if I know if I'm a legitimate guy and you're a, a gangster, I'm not going to be your friend. I don't want to be near you. Right. So no, definitely a long lineage of knowing each other. And, you know, listen, Diddy hasn't exactly been sparkling clean. He's had some things in his personal life he's had to deal with. You know, a lot of people don't know Diddy's father was very close with uh, with Frank Lucas. He was a, he was a drug. Oh, player. I didn't know that. He was wow. killed. He was actually killed in Manhattan. Yeah. His father, when he well, you know why they called him Puff, right? I can imagine well, people thought it was weed, but it isn't, because he used to walk around the locker room sucking his gut in, like puffing himself up like he was a badass. Yep. But he really didn't play football at the Mount, my understanding. Uh, and Andrew Campos, another interesting guy. Campos is a Spanish name. I know. Uh, you know, there's rumor was that his mom was with Richie and his, his father was... But, you know, it's all about money with the mob is. Don't care. You know, it's all about money. The guy, and look... The guy was part of a ring that brought in money, so much money that God forbade them to go into any wakes, any weddings, anything, because they didn't want to appear in the lens of the FBI. So they were smart guys, those kids. Oh, they them made them were, it. And a lot of them were sons of of, of guys. You know, Toy Lacasio, Andrew, um, Fast. Yeah, Andrew's father, uh, I was just reading last year, right? He got caught up in. Yeah. Now, it, what's his lineage? I mean, I don't... Uh, he's been get, around for a while, Greg. He's been around, uh, he's been around for a while. He, and, and he's, I think he's uh, currently locked up in a real estate scam, I believe. Yeah. So it's funny because the Gambinos, as we talked about with Greg, I mean, his son ended up going in. They, they were very big on bringing their kids into it. But, Jack, I got to tell you, this has been... I've done many pieces of content in my life, between sports, mob stuff. One of my favorite things I've ever done. I'm, I'm really glad we were able Thank to. Thank you, likewise. I enjoyed it. On here. Thank you. And, you know, I got a feeling, uh, Jack, you got some real stardom in your future. I got to tell you. I think <laughs> you're, you are you have a fantastic story. So um, I, I don't think this is the last time we're going to see you. Well, good. Anytime. I really enjoyed it, uh, Jeff, you know, and uh, you got a great show. You got a a great mind for this and uh you know I, I i i'm fascinated although i never worked organized crime to this case you know all my cases was all dealing with uh, every other thing is uh you're constantly learning this and uh and the more you learn the more you know you're fascinated with it but yeah, thank you for having me on your show i really enjoyed it yeah, I, want, I want everyone to go do it it came out in 2008 one of my favorite books about mob stuff, making Jack Falcone an undercover FBI agent takes down a mafia family. Everybody go buy that. Because I know everyone that watches this video, you like to read, you like to know about OC, go check that out. Uh, Jack, I think we're going to see you soon. I have a feeling. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me, okay? You got it. Thank Take you. care.
Bye. Uh, Doc Falcone, everybody. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe. We'll see you next time here on The City.